Hey, Marty, how you doing? Hey, how are you? Good, and you? All right, thanks. Okay, just two of us so far, but we got 10 minutes to go. 10 minutes, yeah, we're early. There'll be 16 or 18 people today. Yeah, we usually get the same, similar numbers each week, so. Right. Okay, so here we are, again. Once again, and we're ready to go through the Cold War. So this is number eight, right? So you got two yep, more after this? Two more. How about that? How'd it go this morning? Okay. You know, there's not as much interaction with the Beth Yashurin group. How many did you get with, with them? 14 this morning. Uh -huh. It's usually 14 to 15, 16. Uh -huh. well, that's interesting, right? You get 14, 15 from Beit Shuren and you get 14, 15, 16, 17 from Bresh Shalom. Yeah. yeah. Fascinating thought. Numbers aren't big enough for me to run for uh, president, though. It's okay. There may not be an election. Who knows? <laughs> Think about that. So what's new with you? Nothing much. Here we are. Now, Daniel is taking this class in Tel Aviv, and there were one of the class members was tested positive. Oh, dear. So he is now in quarantine. Is everybody in the class in quarantine? Yeah, they basically quarantine the whole class. In Israel, they know what they're doing. When it comes to quarantine, I'm not sure they know what they're doing when it comes to annexation. That's a different question. Now, next week on Sunday in the afternoon, there'll be a full discussion with all these former Habonim South Africa members right. all over the world on the question of annexation. It'll probably attend, be attended by 300 people. Yeah, there's a bunch of different things online now, uh, programs and... Well, the American community has kind of basically said, hey, not a good idea, think twice about this. By yeah, well, the majority, not yeah, I'm, I'm very conflicted myself. It's a stupid idea. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Hi there. Hey, Suzanne. How you doing? And hi, How Eric. about you? Suzanne, we, 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 you're, you're a little shadowy because we got a window behind you. <laughs> She's just a shadowy character. We know it's you. That's true, I am. You found me out. And we know you're shadowy, that we know. Oh, That's look at the, Marcia. look at, look at the five notes okay. in full, in full bloom. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're in full bloom. Well, I've got, I've got, I've got mountains growing out of my head. <laughs> oh, there are the couple that did so good yesterday. I was impressed. <laughs> huh? What are you talking about? The oh. services, the two of you yesterday. Oh, oh, oh of course. Oh, yes. You always yes. do a great job. Yeah, we're a tag team. Thank you. <laughs> you, got to, you got to worry about this guy, Korach. You know, he's a but I, I'm yeah. not signing autographs today. I'm sorry. No. It's just, it's and, just, and I was going to become your secretary. Well, I'm, yeah. It's very <laughs> fitting that you uh, led off the Torah readings, Martin. Also. Yes, Martin. Martin Korach Owen. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I, I, asked the, I asked the rabbi on for that sheet that they give to the people who are participating. Uh -huh. To put the actual Torah readings on and the parasha, yeah. not the page numbers, because the page numbers don't right. tell us much. So right, the verses. He, yeah, the verses, all that. This yeah. stuff that Nancy distributes. So yeah. he agreed to do that. Yeah, I think they've done that before. For some reason, they didn't this time. I, I said what was that? Didn't. They didn't do. No, for the people who participate, they weren't giving us the list of the Torah readings so that we could know where oh, they were. They did? That's funny. It they just gave us the page numbers. numbers. That doesn't help us. No hey, Sandy. Hi, Sandy. Anyway, they're going to do it. I mean, Nancy's got it on a shared drive. They can just pull it off. By the way, 
Yeah. Microphone. When Nancy was dominating, right? They, they shut, shut off her, her microphone. It's the same thing. So I, I think what we have to do is pause after every cottage or every time there's something like that, you have to pause and make sure your mic is on before you resume when you're done. Yeah, they, they changed the, the Zoom application and it results in slightly different behavior when you mute and unmute. It's, we're trying to- Oh catch. yeah, it just, at the very end when everybody was saying hello and everything, which was great, it just went kaput. Yeah, it, it's, anyway, it's, they're, they're, they keep changing it, so things change a little bit all the time. Those are about well, yeah, this new edition came out in mid-June, but anyway, it's a privacy, it's supposed to be a feature, but it's an inconvenience for us. It's a privacy feature that the host cannot unmute you without your permission. Hmm. Hmm. The problem is if you're standing up because it's a standing part of the service, I can't get to the thing with my finger and do it. So what it, what it amounts to, like say you're doing chakra, you know, and you're ready and you do the Kaddish before the Borthu. So after the Kaddish, you know, then, uh, then Donnie will shut off all the mics again, including yours. <laughs> so when you resume to do the Borthu, you got to make sure that yours is on and you may have to do it. Yeah. It's complicated. I mean, I find the same thing here. It gets a little tricky sometimes. Well, I wish we could do the entire service, have everybody on Zoom because those of us that don't read the Torah or anything, it would be wonderful to be a really more of a participant. Well, the, the trouble with the, you can't say it, use your mic because there would be a cacophony because it never lines up right. Well, if people all try to sing at once, then you get a mess because it, there's always a time a delay. delay that's not consistent. I, I know that, but it still would be nice to feel, I mean, you feel like you're a participant. You're sitting there with your book and it's, you know, like, okay, where am I? I mean, Janice yesterday had the shot of the sanctuary, but it would be so nice to see everybody. I mean, this couple down here, Sandy and Leslie, who say they get all dressed for Shabbat. I'd love to see them. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess if they had the annual meeting with 90 people, I guess you could do the services that I way. I have been on meetings with 300 people all visible. I guess oh my God, that must make you crazy. Well, it depends. If you've got a big enough computer, you can get 49 on a screen. High holidays are going to be interesting. Yeah, they're going to be different. You betcha. Uh, I need to get my other glasses. Right. Hello, everybody. Who said hello? Hi, hello. Hey, hey, hi Peter. I heard, I heard Gingas, I think. Hi, hey. Joyce. Hi. Hi, Joyce. I heard Peter Gingas as well, I think. Yeah, that was me. Martin said. Peter Gingas Hi, Peter. was. Thank you for sending that to me. No problem. Okay. At least I at least know where to find these things. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, okay. I lock on on the British Shalom office account, so I have access to the actual invitation. Martin, you inspired me to try and maybe get a moonscape for my background, but I didn't find a good one yet. <laughs> well, after the thing on Russia, yes, what you might want. <laughs> yeah, if it's... Uh, Peter, what do you have back there? It looks like fish. Is it an aquarium? Oh, he's muted. Oh, if, uh, is the oh my God, Sandy's... Di Leslie's disappearing. She's in Hawaii. <laughs> Joyce is in Hawaii. No, I'm in the Bahamas, and I'm not coming back. Okay, okay. <laughs> what time is it now? It is five o'clock, Henry. All right, we'll wait about, what, another one or two minutes? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'll start off by meeting, muting everybody, and then if you want to talk, just unmute yourself. Okay. Okay. Now I'm asking you to unmute yourself, Aaron. Good afternoon, everyone. There you are. You're good. Welcome to um, class number nine, not number ten. Got two more classes to go after this one. 
We're going to talk about the Cold War today, post-World War II. So basically, how did the Cold War develop? And then, of course, what did it mean for Jews in the Soviet Union? Well, the Soviet Union, starting from 1943 onward, started pushing into Europe, pushed westward. And by May 1945, Soviet troops were placed in Poland, Romania, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and East Germany. Now Stalin told communist ideologue Milovan Gilas, who is a Yugoslav communist, whoever occupies a territory installs his own social system in it. Everyone introduces his own system as far as his armies can reach. That's the way it has to be. This was the Stalin doctrine. And I want to talk a little bit about this before we uh, continue. The Stalin doctrine was ultimately in the imposition of a way of life and not merely a belief or set of beliefs. And in order to impose one way of life upon a people, one must abolish the previous way of life. So it's important to understand how radical this idea is. The most important thing to understand is it represents a mirror image of the kind of radical annihilation that was practiced throughout human history. Because mainly up to this point, if a foreign army came into a land and conquered its people, it sold the people into slavery, it subjugated them, and the conquerors took over the economic and culture. Stalin didn't do that. He merely imposed communism all over Eastern Europe. Now he was able to do that because after World War II, there was a decline of the old great powers in Europe, Germany, France, and England. And it's interesting when you think about it, because of all those three great powers, which of those three powers took the longest to get back to its previous World War II state? Anybody have any ideas? It was England, actually, which is, which is ironic. So you had the decline of the old great powers, you had the rise of a bipolar world. In February 1946, George Keenan, who was the American ambassador to Russia, sent a what's called a long telegram from Moscow that helped to articulate the US government's increasingly hard line against the Soviets. Keenan proposed a policy of containment. He emphasized that the Soviet Union did not see the possibility for a long-term peaceful coexistence with the capitalist world, and that the best strategy was to contain communist expansion around the globe. This became the basis for the U.S. Con the Soviet Union through the Vietnamese War. Now, how did that affect Russian Jews? Well, there became a rise of state anti-Semitism in the Soviet Union. In 1948, specifically, Stalin ordered state security to destroy the Jewish intellectual and theater director, Solomon Mikhail's, and to disband the Jewish anti-fascist committee. Why was this important in the Soviet Union? Well, let's go back to August 24th, 1941. Two dozen Jewish cultural figures led by the Yiddish actor Mikhail issued an international radio appeal to Jews around the world to unite in the struggle against Nazi Germany. 
Now, to allow Jews to appeal to their fellow Jews was an extraordinary step, especially that the Kremlin allowed it. But Stalin understood in 1941 the need for the regime to repair relations with the Western powers in the face of the German onslaught. Although Soviet officials were not happy with the committee's unauthorized initiatives, they did not interfere as long as the war continued. But with the outbreak of the Cold War, America became the enemy and contact with the West was severely curtailed. The committee's wartime activities were now held against it. And the turning point for the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee came in 1948. That September, Golda Meir visited Moscow as Israel's first diplomatic representative. She was greeted by cheering crowds at Moscow's main synagogue on the Sabbath, and then later on the high holidays. Such a spontaneous demonstration in support of a foreign leader particularly the representative of a Jewish state, was regarded as a provocation by Stalin. And the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee was held responsible, although later historians all agree that the demonstrations by the Jews in Moscow were spontaneous and were not directed by any Jewish organization. In November of 1948, the committee was officially closed and its archives were confiscated. Over the winter of 1948-49, hundreds of Yiddish cultural figures were arrested, including many people associated with the Jewish anti-fascist committee. Now, Mikhail was already dead, having been assassinated on Stalin's orders the previous January. There became a widespread political campaign against cosmopolitanism. What in the world was cosmopolitanism? Stalin defined it as just as the entire German people bear responsibility for Hitler's aggression, so too Jewish people must bear responsibility for the actions of the bourgeois cosmopolitans. So the bourgeois cosmopolitans were Israelis and Jews, particularly in the United States. Well, what did this have to do with Jews in the Soviet Union? For one thing, Soviet Jews became targets as tensions grew with the West. Also, Israel became allied with the United States, in fact. So Jews began to be viewed in the Soviet Union as a counter-revolutionary nationality. Now, what became of counter-revolutionary nationalities in 1943 and 44 in the Soviet Union? Do you remember a couple of classes ago, we talked about how counter-revolutionary nationalities were deported to the Urals, to Siberia, and to Soviet Asia. In 1952, Stalin announced to the 19th Party Congress and published a 25,000 word essay. I wonder if he wrote it actually. The Economic Problems of Socialism in the USSR saying that the country faced capitalist encirclement, which was partly true, but it was also partly used to set the stage for a new purge, particularly of Molotov. Remember, Molotov was the great Soviet military hero of World War II. Mikoyan and Voshilov, who were the last remaining old Bolsheviks, old Bolsheviks and a purge in the upper reaches of the party. Most of the old Bolsheviks had been killed in the purges of 1936 and 37. In November 52, the Slansky trial was held in Prague. 
Why was this significant? Rudolf Slansky was the former Secretary General of the Czechoslovak Communist Party. He, along with 13 others, were arrested and charged with being engaged in a broad conspiracy with the United States and Israel to undermine socialist rule. 11 of the 14 accused in the Slansky trial were Jewish. And after a week of testimony, the co-defendants were confessed to being Trotskyites, Titoist Zionists, and bourgeois nationalist traitors to the Czechoslovak people. The 14 were found guilty, and the 11 of them were hung. Now, this was in Czechoslovakia. What did that portend in the Soviet Union? Well, it became obvious in December 1952, a military court in Kiev sentenced to death three people with recognizably Jewish names for criminal conspiracy in the field of trade. And the party journal Agitator's Handbook printed a prominent article against Zionism. In January 1953, the doctor's plot was unveiled. Stalin's personal physician, Vladimir Vinogradov, was arrested with eight other Jewish doctors who were all working in the Kremlin Medical Clinic. They were accused of being foreign agents engaged in a plot to murder leading Soviet military figures and Stalin. The accused were taken to Lavorto prison where they were tortured and accused of espionage on behalf of the Americans and their junior partners, the British. So we can see that this was the beginning of a feverish campaign that Stalin was building in the Soviet Union, an anti-Jewish campaign. At the same time, it was an anti-Western campaign. I printed the text of two articles that appeared in leading Soviet newspapers, both on January 13, 1953. Now, it's important to understand that no article would have appeared in TASS or Pravda, two leading Communist Party publications, if Stalin had not approved the articles ahead of time. From TASS, some time ago, the agents of state security uncovered a terrorist plot of doctors who had made it their aim to cut short the lives of active public figures of the Soviet Union by means of sabotaged medical treatment. These doctors had now confessed to their crimes. These doctors had also been targeting leading military officers among them three Soviet marshals, an army general, and an admiral. But arrests disrupted their evil plans, and the criminals did not succeed in attaining their aim. They were nothing less than monsters in human form. From Pravda on the same day, whom did these monsters serve? Who directed the criminal terrorist and wrecking activity of these vile traitors to the motherland? Notice these themes, okay, that these Jewish doctors were monsters, they were traitors to the motherland, and that they were plotters. What purpose did they want to achieve through the murders of active public figures of the Soviet state? The bosses of the USA and their British junior partners know that it is impossible to secure mastery over other nations by peaceful means. Feverishly preparing for a new world war, they are sending more and more of their spies into the USSR and the people's democracies, trying to succeed 
where the Hitlerites failed, trying to create a subversive fifth column in the USSR. So not only were the Jews in cahoots with the US and the British, but they were trying to create a fifth column in the Soviet Union. Nearly every day for the next six weeks, the Soviet press questioned the loyalty of all of the country's Jewish doctors. So what do you expect happened as a result? How did the Soviet people react to this? Well, for example, patients refused to take their medicines or give medications to their children if their doctors were Jewish out of fear of poisoning. There were calls for the Jews to be removed from managerial and leadership positions. There were incidences of explicit anti-Semitism, an extension of anti-Jewish purges in Hungary and Romania. Rumors began to spread that Stalin intended to deport Soviet Jews to far off places of exile. For example, Kazakhstan, Siberia, and Vyrobazhan. Did people tend to take these rumors of expulsion seriously? What do you think? Heck yeah. It had been done to a number of Soviet nationalities, as we discussed a couple of classes ago, during 1943 to 1945. For example, Stalin deported numerous entire populations of groups he considered to be ethnic troublemakers, including Koreans, Chechens, English, Meshkidian Turks, and Crimean Tartars. Now this is interesting. No historians have ever found documents confirming that Stalin had drawn up plans to deport Soviet Jews. And several Soviet dissident figures. I'm sorry, in contrast, several Soviet dissident figures expressed the belief that such a deportation plan for Jews existed. But there was never any proof that such a plan was drawn up. Might have such a plan been in, in Stalin's mind? Well, some people think so. But what happened? On March the 6th, 1953, I have it on 52, that's wrong. It's 1953. Stalin died. On March 6th, 1953, there was a Jewish holiday. Anybody know what that holiday was? You might know it. Good guess, but that wasn't the one. <laughs> Purim. Purim. How fitting a day for him to die. April 3rd, 1953. The Central Committee Presidium resolved to fully rehabilitate and release from custody the doctors and members of their families arrested in association with the so-called case of the record document. One of the reforms that accompanied the announcement was the banning of the use of torture against people who were arrested in the Soviet Union. Now, this is a point I want to talk and open up for a discussion. What do you think Stalin's motives were? Were they simply that Stalin became more open about a anti-Semitism that he always held? Was it primarily a product of domestic and foreign policy calculations? Was it part of a plan to keep society mobilized by provoking anxiety about external threats and using domestic groups as scapegoats? Was anti-Semitism a means of putting pressure on Stalin's Western opponents, on the US in particular, all of the above. or a little bit of all of the above? Right. 
All of the above. Of all of the above. No, all of them. Are we on mute? Mm. Yeah. The Jews lived in a lot of countries, including large yeah. numbers in the United States and yes. Israel and so forth. So it's very scary for him. From his perspective, that's a real threat. Exactly. It was a real threat from his perspective. As to was Stalin anti-Semitic? One of the things to understand is when he was a youth, before he became a communist, what did he want to be when he grew up? He wanted to be a doctor, I thought. Nope. No? A priest. Oh, oh. oh he was he Georgian. Wanted, yeah, he was Georgian. He wanted to be a priest in the Orthodox Church. Well, then he would have been raised, definitely. Yeah, he would have. <laughs> values, those anti-Semitic. And he did study theology for a while as a, as a young person. But there were Jews in the party in the early days, and he was there from the beginning. Yes, there were Jews in the party. And they were actually instrumental in his carrying out the famine in the Ukraine. Yes, they were. But it's interesting, by the time that Stalin died, just before his death, that the Jews had been barred from sensitive posts in communist foreign service, in the military, from the KGB, and particularly from party leadership. At the time of Stalin's death, only eight of 1,443 members of the Supreme Soviet were Jewish. That's a big difference than the Jewish membership in the Communist Party back in the early days, in the Leninist days. Yes, Andrew, you had a question? It is, is part of the goal there to unite the rest of the people by doing what the czars did of fomenting anti-Semitism to consolidate power among the people who naturally hated Jews? There's no, there's not much evidence of that, which is a great question. But that doesn't, that did not seem to be what motivated Stalin. Uh, the, the other thing is, I mean, wasn't Stalin known as an extreme paranoid? Yeah, and that's a good point. In the couple of years before his death, from 51, between 51 and 53, there were a number of people who commented, especially from outside the USSR, that Stalin was becoming increasingly paranoid. So was it a case of clinical paranoia or was it a case of political paranoia? Because, could it have been a little bit of both? Yeah, it could have been a little bit of both, exactly. Because the Cold War was a real fact. The United States took it very seriously. And one of the interesting things was the United States was rehabilitating West Germany. And Stalin was paranoid about West Germany, calling the country re a bunch of revanchists. Revanchists are people who were going to become fascist Hitlerites once. He called the um, rulers of West Germany you faded United States Hitlerites. They called them Hitlerites, and Stalin was convinced that the U.S. was arming and rehabilitating West Germany in order to attack the Soviet Union once again. He really believed that. Aaron, did, did um, Stalin have a role in getting rid of Trotsky? Yes. Now, don't forget that this was in the 1930s. Right, but I mean, that was a rival for the successor to Lenin, presumably. Yeah, but he had a role in getting rid of anybody who he thought was a rival. Stal uh, Trotsky, of course, was the most famous one and the most serious rival to Stalin at a period of time. Why? Because he was articulate, well-known, 
And his part of history in the Soviet Union, remember that he took over the Red Army, leadership of the Red Army during the Civil War. And he basically saved, in, in a very real sense, he's taking over the Red Army and providing it with leadership, saved the Soviet Union from defeat. He wasn't a military general, he was a political general. But don't forget, the military was subservient to Trotsky back then. Any questions before we go ahead to the trial of Joseph Brodsky? OK, I put the trial. Uh, Bruce. Aaron, a question about the Jews in academia and so forth. I mean, it's, these numbers are stunning, right? Yes. The number of Jewish mathematicians, scientists. Yeah, we're going to discuss that. Others. Unbelievable how many Jews were in those professions in the, in the Soviet Union. Yes. So let's talk about that right now. At this time, in the early 1950s, Jews were a large part of the Soviet professional elite. 95% of the Jews in the Soviet Union by this time lived in urban areas. 11% of the Jewish population were college graduates versus 2% of the Russian people. The number of scientific workers per 10,000 people in the Soviet Union who were Jewish were 135 compared to 10 for the Russians. At the same time, in the 1959 census, 410,000 Jews out of 2.2 million gave Yiddish as their mother tongue. So what were we seeing? What two trends were going on simultaneously with the Jews in the Soviet Union? <laughs> One, that they were becoming urbanized. They were becoming professionalized. But at the same time, they were becoming totally assimilated. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. Mm. And it's very important to understand that before we get to the next class, how assimilated Jews in the Soviet Union had become by the 1960s, by 1959 census. Anti-Zionism became an official ideology from the mid 1950s onward, as the Soviet Union became a major arms supplier to Egypt. Zionists were attacked for their alleged collaboration with the Nazis and for Israel's alleged support for West German revanchism. In 1960, what's revanchism? Revanchism means preparing again for war. Oh, okay. Against the Soviet Union. Okay. Hey, Aaron? Yes. So with all this anti-Semitism, how in the world did the uh, Soviet Union ever vote to allow the formation of Israel? I know there was a reason, but I can't remember what it was. Good question. Well, the Soviet Union hoped at the beginning, they saw that the leading party, the leading parties in Israel at the time were leftist. And they had hoped that Israel would become if not, that would be favorable in the Cold War to the Soviet Union. If not a communist country, at least a country that would be favorable in the Cold War to the Soviet Union. That didn't happen, of course, for many reasons. One of the reasons, of course, was because <clears throat> Israel was being supplied both by weapons and economically by the United States. But in the early years, Czechoslovakia was the yes. major supplier of weapons. Yes, of they were. Arms. That was, wow. yes, that was very early on. But after 1948, the United States became the major supplier. Weren't the French major suppliers between the in early the 1950s? Years? Yeah. yeah, I mean, if you look at the Sinai campaign in Israel, the airplanes that the Air Force flew, 
were French mirages. It was only after that that they started getting U.S. Phantoms and other U.S. fighter planes. But up to, up to the 60s, it was the French mirages that they flew. But here's the thing. Israel did not become a communist country. Israel did not become a pro-Russian country. Partly also, don't forget, Ben-Gurion was a Zionist through and through. And what did he hope, who did he hope would make Aliyah to Israel and strengthen the state at that time? American Jews. Yes. Where the numbers are, right? Where the numbers American were. Jews and, and, and bringing financial support with them. Yes, that didn't happen, of course. But that's what Ben-Gurion hoped for. And even without them immigrating, I'm sure a lot of the financial support they were dependent on was coming from American Jews. Yes, it was. Not from the American government, from, from American Jews. No, from the Jews. Jews. But, you know, how many, how many of us grew up with the box for trees, oh, yeah. the JNF, <laughs> constantly, you know? That was when Israel was poor and American Jews were rich. The tables had been right. turned. I know, I'm saying that it's, 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 it's early 60s. We were all, I mean, raised that way. Yeah, but it, it, was, it was not just the United States. It was, it was all through Europe and South African Jews who I believe yeah. statistically may have been given, giving more per capita than those in the West. Yeah, unlike European or American Jews, there was... The whole South African Jewish community was Zionist. Every single person. There was no such thing as not being a Zionist. Mm. In South Africa. Yeah. Okay, so 1964, the trial of Joseph Brodsky. And I included this. So you have a uh, taste of what it was like to be a Jew in the Soviet Union in the early 1960s. So who is Joseph Brodsky? Does anybody know? Has anybody ever read any of his works? This is be a poet. Yeah, he was a <laughs> Russian Jewish poet. And he was put on trial for crimes against the state. He was accused of social, being a social parasite. And he was found guilty of being a social parasite and sentenced to five years of exile and hard labor. Now, he didn't serve the five years, by the way. There was a tremendous campaign, especially in Europe, among intellectuals, French and British, and other intellectuals to free him after he was sentenced. And he ended up getting released after a year in Soviet prison and being allowed to emigrate from the United uh, to the United States. Now I included a trans part of the transcript from his trial. And I did this to give you a flavor of what it was like in the Soviet Union at the time. The judge talking to Brodsky. You worked at a factory for one year and then didn't work for half a year. During the summer, you participated in a geological expedition and then didn't work for four months. And she lists the places where he worked and the intervals between his jobs. So why you didn't work during the intervals and why you led a parasitical way of life? Brodsky answers, I did work during the intervals. I did just what I am doing now. I wrote poems. <laughs> the judge, that is you wrote your so-called poems what was the purpose of you changing your place of work so often? Brodsky answers, I began working when I was 15. I found it all interesting. I changed work because I wanted to learn as much as possible about life and about people. So what does the judge ask Brodsky? How were you useful to the motherland? Brodsky answers, I wrote poems. That's my work. 
I'm convinced. I believe that what I've written will be of use to people, not only now, but in future generations. As I said, Brodsky was found guilty and sentenced to five years of, in prison. So what did that tell you about anti-Semitism in the Soviet Union in the 1960s? Well, first of all, it wasn't like anti-Jewish discrimination and anti-Semitism in other parts of the world. The Jews were considered to be cosmopolitan traitors, traitors to the motherland. And there was propaganda that the Soviet government generated in order to keep that on people's minds and in, in their attention. Secondly, there were many activities that were closed to the Jews in the Soviet Union, particularly in the party, in the military, and any sensitive posts, like the, dipl dipl the, dipl the diplomacy. That there was enforced assimilation that any Jews who thought about emigrating were considered traitors to the Soviet motherland. And that's why many Jews at that point who might have thought about applying for emigration in the Soviet Union to get the heck out of Dodge were afraid to because those who wanted to apply to emigrate were fired from their jobs, were not given immigration visas, and were sometimes even put on trial and sentenced to prison. And throughout the Soviet Union, there was a widespread denial of an international Jewish culture and a widespread linkage of Zionism to imperialism and anti-Soviet Union politics. That's where the Jews were in the Soviet Union, basically, until 1964. Any questions or comments? Um, I think it's important, one of the most important words in that whole thing was when the judge accused him of being a parasite, because that was against the law in the Soviet Union. And so what happened with Jews who were lost their their jobs as soon as they tried to emigrate they they were in danger then of being, of being yeah they were called parasites and they were in danger of being uh, uh, imprisoned arrested and, and imprisoned yeah that's a great point joyce thank you for making that well, yeah, in the communist view of the world of what they what they think of as human rights one of the human rights is the right to work not it's our fun. right to work in Texas. <laughs> you, you had a right to have a job. That was a human right. So if you did not avail yourself of that, you were a parasite, right? a parasite or anti-Soviet or worse. Good point, Marty, yes. I was kind of amazed that uh, they actually said that the Zionists were collaborating with the Nazis. I mean, if you could believe oh, that, yeah. then anything you say makes sense. Yeah, well, when it comes to uh, Zionism, <laughs> nothing makes sense and everything makes sense. Can I, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure, Suzanne. Um, what Brodsky was, you know, the nature of the trial, what he was accused of, you probably have already said this, but this was a fairly common thing, wasn't it? I mean, he was... He was not unusual in being those terms being thrown out at him. No. And one thing that I did not mention, and that we'll discuss in much greater detail next class, that Jews were not the only ones who were accused of being um, parasites or anti-Soviet or traitors to the motherland, okay? And any political dissidents were called parasites, traitors to the motherland. Any dissidents, whether they were artists or politicians or nationalists or whatever, anybody who did not tell the official line was a dissident and their activities were subject to being arrested 
and put in prison, and many of them were. One of the most famous of the Russian dissidents, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, you've all heard of him, correct? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so he was sentenced, I think in his original sentence was 18 years in the gulags. Okay, but we're, we're just interested in, from our point of view about how it fell on the Soviet Jewish population. Look, conformity to one ideology, to one way of thinking is a feature of any totalitarian state. And when any revolutionary or radical group tells you it's my way or the highway, as a Jew, your antennae ought to go up and realize that this is dangerous. Remember that religion was considered to be the opiate of the people. And so all religious faiths were in, in danger in the Soviet Union. You know, they I grew up believing that. Well, by the 1950s and 60s, most of the religious um, institutions and any opportunity for religious education for Jews was in the Soviet Union had already been eradicated. Mm -hmm. Now, this is going to be very important as it plays out in our last couple of classes because religion, the idea of being a Jew by religion, which we take as central to our Jewish identity in the United States was not a central motivating factor of Soviet Jews. For Soviet Jews, the motivation was they were considered a nationality. They it was were in their passport. Excuse me? It was yeah, in their passport. Their ID document, whatever they their, I, their ID document. They agree with Hitler. Their internal passport. Mm -hmm. On line number five, mm -hmm. what is your nationality? Jewish. Well, the idea of Judaism as purely a religion is a uniquely American idea. Well, I wouldn't say it's uniquely American because... Well, don't it's about that fact, I love this topic, but it's an American notion. Well, it's a notion that... Why, is the, why do you think it's an American notion? Because it's... Okay, I would argue that it's not for the simple reason that it did not take hold until after the reform movement. And the reform movement did not take hold in the United States to begin with. But it was exported to America. Right. So for started German in Germany, Jews... Started in Germany. Yes, exactly, Marty. What? So it's, yeah, the idea of the Jews as a religion, not of as a, a, a ethnicity or a people, took root in Germany, not the United States. Now, it did take root in the United States later on after the 1840s. But that's why I, I would argue it's not unique to American Jews. Okay? How many, how many German Jews are left? They're first well, American Jews. Well, by, of course, by this time, there was not a German Jewish population left. I think it's a subject for a different class, but I think it's an interesting one. Yeah, exactly. That would be that would be worth a class in and of itself. Right. Okay. Any last comments or a comment? I've just been reading about the alienation and sedition sedition sedition, sedition act. acts during uh, John Adams' administration. Uh, it keeps me from getting too feeling too superior. <laughs> Uh, you certainly could not publish what you wanted during those days. Well, that's all true. And there was a book that was uh, published last year about, uh, and I forget the name of the author, about Ulysses Grant and the American Jewish population. Oh, yeah. He had, uh, he had uh, actually tried to kick the Jews out of a particular Tennessee. area of the South. Yeah. yeah. Lincoln because he considered them to be seditious. Lincoln overruled. Yeah. yeah. 
So okay. Aaron, in the next class, are you going to talk about the, the desire of Jews to leave? And the, yes, and yes, we're yeah. leaving Mother Russia in the next class, folks. Okay, good. Aaron, how many more classes do we have, and do we have one next week? Yes, two more classes. And we have one next week? Yes. Okay. Nobody what? celebrates the 3rd of July. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Actually, Where are you going to go anyway? Hey, we're not going anywhere. <laughs> The the I'll go to the kitchen. That the seems to be the furthest I go these days. I want to do my laundry. <laughs> which is in the, 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 the weekend. Bathroom. Anyhow, thank you, everybody, for thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Aaron. Thank you Aaron. Thanks, Aaron. It's great. Hi, Aaron. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Look forward thank to you. seeing you all next week. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, Marty. Time, same place. Thank you, Marty, for everything. You're welcome.